Can I challenge you, Rich, on that? Let's do that. A little bit of bullying is actually a good thing. I got a few real good hooks in, and the, uh, the third one, the last one, knocked his life to be recognized, and they want success with women. Do not get married. Avoid family creation. Vasectomy in your 20s. And you want my feedback on that. So I would love your feedback on that. It's, Rich, yeah. it's known as one-itis, and a lot of guys get it. You know, they get laser focused on that one girl. 20 red flags, common traits of problematic women. There's nothing that I found that, that got women as interested in you as often bearers. So Rich, 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 you didn't take his girlfriend off of him, did you? I yes, guys, what's going on? So I am very pleased to say I am joined by the one and only Richard Cooper, the main man, the beacon of hope for all men across the planet. Richard, how are you doing, sir? Thanks, Sham. Nice to see you, man. Excellent. Lovely. My first question is around you talking about men chasing excellence and being the best versions of themselves. Um, but in that pursuit, obviously we face mental health challenges. I think just about everybody, you know, nobody's on a swift linear path to success, right? There's challenges mm. that you face and some people face more challenges than others. And uh, I wanted to know, firstly, your take on mental health and how do men overcome mental health challenges on their pursuit to happiness and success? Yeah, so on, on that path to happiness and, and success and doing all that work, there's going to be a lot more failures and there will be wins. So I think framing it correctly and making sure it's understood uh, so that that guy that wants to go and, let's say, start up a business and put a little dent in the universe understands that there are going to be way more failures than there are successes. Um, reading biographies from successful entrepreneurs, I would recommend that, you know, as a starting place so you understand all the failures that uh, got in the way of the success. Everybody sees a, somebody that's successful and they say, oh, he's an overnight success or something like that. But the truth of the matter is every overnight success I know took usually about a decade of work. And within that decade, failure after failure, pivot after pivot. Um, I think a lot of young men today have this preconceived notion that, it, you know, it's a linear line, uh, but it's very squiggly and it goes all over the place. And sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down and dealing with rejection is a skill that you need to get good at. Being a strategist is a skill that you need to be good at. Um, so, you know, learning those skills young and making sure that you infuse them into the fabric of your being will get you there uh, sooner than you think. Why do you think it is that maybe it's just a perception or maybe it's coming out? It's difficult to say, right? But why do you think that younger men and the newer generations tend to face more mental health challenges than we're in older generations? Well, we've become a society of weaker, softer men, haven't we? Um, the, you know, the generation that my dad grew up in and my granddad grew up in was tough. Um, there were boundaries, there was disciplines, there was spanking still, you know, at that time. We're now raising a generation of entitled soft men. Um, I call this phenomenon the pussification of the West, if, you know, we can use that term, because essentially you have weaker, softer men with lower testosterone than they did several decades ago. Um, it's, it's a combination of nurture and nature. Um, society and culture uh, softens men to the extent that, you know, we all, not all, but 70% of the population essentially fell for a scamdemic a few years ago. We stood on dots, we wore face diapers, we took experimental jabs thinking that we needed to do all these things to save the planet. Uh, when in reality and in hindsight, when all the data was released and the evidence was presented, it was no more dangerous than the common cold. I think just stick, sticking on that topic of mental health firstly, right? I think from my understanding, what I believe it is, is the society has drastically changed, okay? The vast majority of society now, you don't see many people going out to bars and clubs as you used to. You don't see people out as much as you used to. And the reason is, is because everybody's on these little devices, right? And in mm. this interactive world. And that's increasing as time goes on. So that's one aspect of it. And I think we have this delusion of what we think, you know, other people's lives are. And then we reflect that on ourselves. So I think that's one aspect of it. But I think another aspect is we have a lot more free time on our hands now. And I think back in the you know olden days, people were working a lot harder. They were more into their purpose and their mission. And, uh, you know, because they didn't have a choice, like you had a family to feed, you know, and if you go back a bit more further down the generations, you know, if you had to go 
down the road and go get a bucket of water to bring that back. I mean, the last thing that's going to be on your mind is, you know, things, you know, reminiscing in your brain about a woman or whatever it is that's on your mind. So I think essentially we mental health is something that we not all the time because there can be phys physical issues as well uh, with regards to the levels of chemicals that we have in our body and the hormones that, you know, everybody's different. But barring that, I do think we get in our own way a lot nowadays. And I think that some of the issues that face younger men is one, obviously you discussed there about lower testosterone levels. And I have found that not just myself, but people around me and everybody I've spoken to, if I'm not training, if I fall off my routine in the gym, I will automatically start to feel down and mm. I'll start to not feel that same rigor and that same energetic. Um, I'll, I won't be my energetic self anymore. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. Like I said, there, there's, there's a lot of different attack vectors that are softening men. Um, social media is just example of one of hundreds. Um, you know, somebody's social media feed on Instagram is a highlight reel of their best moments in life. I've said this many times because you see um, parents, especially moms on Facebook do this, where they'll post the most perfect picture of their children. Look at my two angels. But they'll never post the picture of Billy and Nancy beating the living crap out of each other in the back seat where Billy smashes his ice cream cone over his sister's head. That never gets shared. But that's, but that's the reality of about probably 90% of her life. There's only very short moments that you see shared on social media that are absolutely perfect or look perfect. And a lot of the times they're not perfect and they have to touch them up with Photoshop or something like that or a filter. So you have to understand that um, these things aren't real. They have been presented to you as real, but they're manipulated truths. And the word, the world is a lot harder and, and tougher than what you think it is. Like I said, you know, Older generations had it harder. You know, the, like kids today don't have chores. They don't have to cut the lawn. Parents will hire lawn care companies. I remember pushing around the lawnmower when I was about seven or eight years old, right? Like this is this is things that you don't see children do anymore because, you know, mom or dad don't want to force them to do it. Or if mom or dad are divorced, they don't want to be the one that be, you know, this the bad parent because then they'll run to the other parent and make a big fuss about it. So there's a lot of things happening out there. Like I said, there's a lot of different attack vectors that are softening men. We could spend hours discussing them all, but it's a reality of today's world, right? 100%. You just brought back some memories with the uh, with the lawnmower. I remember having to take that lawnmower around and the wire getting chopped and my dad really disciplining me, but we yeah. don't get that anymore, right? Yeah, you don't hear about learn. that today anymore. No, no, that's how you learn. But I, I never understood when I was young about doing the small things. I had an elder, I've got an elder brother and my eldest brother would always, you know, he'd take me to the boxing gym. He would whoop my butt, you know, he would, uh, he would teach me how to assemble things. And mm -hmm. it's not until later years in my life that I started to see the the value of these things, going to the gym, learning how to train. I took it for granted. I thought I wasted a lot of time early on learning how to train, how to exercise, being involved in boxing, so on and so forth. But in later life, you start to see the valuable lessons. Yeah, I think combat, combat, sex, and hunting are probably the three most natural things. And I don't use the word feeling that often when I talk. I use thinking when I discuss topics. But I think as a man, when it comes to sex, hunting, and fighting, those three things feel very, very natural. It's infused in the fabric of our DNA. And combat is something that's been taken away from us. Uh, even in Boy Scouts, like when I was a kid, we used to play this game British Bulldog where, you know, Essentially, you'd line up on each end of the field and you just charge and ram the crap out of each other sort of thing. They don't allow that anymore because children will be hurt. You know, they're afraid of what the lawyers will do. Yeah, and I think this is uh, something that's very prevalent over in, in Western society. And I'm not anti-West, but I do believe that this is something that because we don't talk about it. who's going to talk about it? if we don't help develop you know the west and the culture that's developing right who's going to do it if we don't do it right? right and i think that this is something that's developing in the west and you look at for example the ufc we've seen khabib come out and absolutely dominate the ufc i'm not i, I don't watch the ufc too much but you see a lot of fighters coming from that russian block uh, and because and they're the tough. fact is they they are very tough and it's the way they're brought up and um I know somebody who's a local, um, he's a local uh, Muay Thai fighter and he's going over to Dagestan soon to get some, to get his ass whooped probably, but he's a good fighter. So he's going to learn a lot, but he's got to go over there to find, to find challenges uh, in the, in the combat world to that extent. Yeah. As, as a young man, you know, as a rite of passage, challenges are part of that rite of passage being challenged, you know, 
fighting, struggle, loss, rejection. These are all things that men are no longer taught to, to overcome. They're taught to, oh, uh, you know, let's try to level the playing field. Oh, Billy didn't make it. Well, let's give him a participation ribbon just to make him feel good, right? Agreed, agreed. And I think this just comes back to that adage of what we've been talking about, about the Western society being moved towards a more softer society and we're yeah. going to be losing in real time to the competitors over in the east we we already are we know that china is is teaching masculinity to its children they're you know they're teaching combat to their school children they're removing what they call sissy men from uh public broadcast channels in the in the internet whereas here in the west it's embraced you have public figures like dylan mulvaney who's a flamboyant uh, gay man pretending that he's a woman landing uh, big, large social media gigs for public companies, right? I think what you have in in society now is a a push towards certain agendas which are taking place. And I don't necessarily have any issues with uh, a grown adult pursuing whatever they want to pursue. But where I think my issue comes is when it's being pushed pushed down your throat through multiple avenues whether it's going into a book celebrated. store but it's 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 extreme I, I i wouldn't say it's just celebrated i'd say it's it's promoted very very um in the most rigorous fashion possible in every platform in every metric uh, we have certain agendas and it's not just one agenda it's several mm -hmm. um and it, it doesn't make any sense to me why it's pushed on people i mean if you and then when you're working somewhere if you don't adhere to the status quo norms mm -hmm. you get you get disciplined for it yeah one of the one of the strange behaviors that they're that they really tend to celebrate to a large degree today is obesity and the narrative becomes well for women you're beautiful at any weight they'll you know they'll tell we literally have now obese uh supermodels you know is what they call them plus size models supermodels whatever they happen to be and they put them on magazine covers, they put them on television shows, they tell them how strong and how brave they are, but they don't say, they don't say anything about their health issues, they don't say anything about their destroyed knees, they don't say anything about their diabetes, they don't say anything about their, you know, inflamed gut or any of those things. You can tell these people are not healthy. Uh, men are not attracted to that, but they're trying to convince men that this is attractive. And there's a there's a big struggle with that. You know, conventionally masculine men that still exist will push back. The softer, weaker ones with low testosterone tend to embrace it because they don't seem to have very many options. Can I challenge you, Rich, on that? Let's do that. Okay. Let's say, for example, right, you have a person who is obese, but the reason they're obese is not because of their lack of going to the gym or a lack of diet, but they're they're obese because, you know, they're um they may have an illness of some sort and you we do know right there are different illnesses that can cause that and they can try as hard as they like but they're struggling to lose weight what's your thoughts on there on that that's on a that very side? very tiny percentage of the obesity that exists out there the vast majority of it is bad lifestyle choices it's terrible food and not moving enough that's really what it boils down to there's no such thing as big bone people or any of the excuses that you've ever heard out there. They just don't exist. There's no dig sites out there where they've been excavating the ruins of Pompeii and they found, oh, we found a big bone person over here. Let's, you know, let's mark that. They just don't exist. So the vast majority are these excuses. But yes, I will agree with you. There are some, there are some slight medical conditions, but that's a very tiny percentage. I agree. And I think even if you do have um, these if you have medical issues, and I do think some people are genetically predisposed as well to being more obese than other people, and some people are obviously on the other side of the spectrum where they're just genetic gifts. Um, but I think that irrespective of where you are, what your starting point is, I think you need to do the best that you can do. And you should, you know, you should have a clean diet, you should have a regimented lifestyle where you're going to the gym, you're exercising and doing the best that you can with what you've been given. We haven't all been given all the gifts of life. You know, not everybody is... Um, you know, tall, um, muscular, and not everybody's like that, but you've got to build that, right? You have to try your best with what you're given. Correct. Yeah, you've got to do the work, man. Like, the work is always required, but I'm, but I'm telling you, there, there's, there's a, a very distinct and strong correlation when I'm at the grocery store between what somebody looks like and what they take out of their shopping buggy and they put on the conveyor belt. Anybody that's out of shape and obese, there's always a distinct correlation between what they eat and what they look like. So, Rich, obviously you do coaching with people, right? And you've been coaching for a while. Do you find that, that the way to get men into shape and to get them to chase excellence, not just physically, right? We're also in other dimensions as well, whether it's mm -hmm. business, 
uh, finances, whatever it is, right? Do you find that that sort of tough love approach works? Shaming works, believe it or not. I was at a um, I was at a uh, a ski lodge a few months ago, and one of the guys in our group who was probably the least out of shape. He wasn't fat or anything like that, but we were talking about physical fitness and strength, and he would be what I would you know essentially define as skinny fat. Now, when you're standing amongst your peers and men that are strong, virtuous, uh, you know, are doing things with their lives. Like I essentially just finished having an arm wrestling competition with one of the other guys who's about 20, 22 years younger than me. And I beat him. Uh, that says something you're going to pay attention to the person talking to you. Now, what has he been doing since then? He's been working out, eating right. His girlfriend's been making compliments. You know, she said to him, well, what did Rich say to you that made you change this pattern? And he said, he called me skinny fat and I was embarrassed. So, Rich, 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 you didn't take his girlfriend off, off him, did you? I did not take his girlfriend off him. I'm not that guy. I never do that to my friends. But, you know, like, like shaming works, you know, a little bit of bullying is actually a good thing, I believe. I think that's one of the reasons why we've got a softer, weaker, you know, society. Children aren't allowed to pick on each other in the schoolyard anymore. Um, I wanted to wear nicer clothing because the kids would make fun of my jeans and my, you know, the patches my mom would sew on my jeans. I didn't come from an affluent family, despite what some people, you know, seem to think based on my life today. But, you know, I would, I would then think to myself, okay, well, if my family's not going to buy it for me, then I'll have to make the money and I'll have to go and buy those clothing or, or those pieces of, of garment so that people don't make fun of me, right? Because I want to look the part. I want to represent, you know, in, in such a regard. So believe it or not, I think shaming works. You know, a little bit of bullying is probably a good thing for society. And I think that taking it away is not going to serve as well long term. I think in all seriousness, right, I think particularly with bullying, this is my take on it, right? I think that what what they're trying to do as a society is eliminate the external factors and develop a society where everybody is nice to it. Is that's just not going to happen? You may get it on the surface, but internally you're still going to get it. And if you start taking the onus away from yourself, if, because at the end of the day, if the only thing that makes a person depressed and unhappy is what is going on internally, you can't control the weather, you can't control your partner, you can't control anything outside of what is here, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't control that, you don't control your brain, you don't control your physio, your 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 training, your exercise, your daily routine, you don't control these things and you don't control and have a stoic mindset then you're going to be doomed for failure irrespective of whether it's now or later you can switch job you can you can you can open up your own company you can you know you a kid can move school but that's not going to get rid of the issue in that you know we could have a situation where you're getting bullied at one school and then that kid could be getting bullied in another school and and it can it can switch and that's the way life is and you have to be robust as an individual and uh, develop um, develop a strong mind Yes, yeah, self-control is an interesting concept, you know, now that you've brought that up, because that's what obesity comes from. It comes from a lack of self-control. It comes from the inability to, to manage what you put in your face, you know, at the end of the day. Um, it also comes from the inability to, you know, not take your health and movement seriously. Like moving is incredibly important for humans. We've been moving for millions of years, you know, sitting on a couch or doing what we're doing right now for an hour is not the best use of our physical abilities, but movement has to be part and parcel of the day. Kids today, not even kids, I would say men even, you know, as adults have addictions to things like video games, pornography, like these are all coping mechanisms. They're all outlets that they use to try to achieve conventional masculine status, like strength, you know, for example, uh, kids playing video games or men even playing video games who might be at the top of their leaderboard, you know, being, being the number one guy, that's great. Good for you. But at the end of the day, uh, if you don't challenge yourself in real, like, like if you don't have real life combat, if you don't get into a fight at some point, you don't know what getting punched in the face is like, you think that you're a winner, but you've not really had any adversarial sort of combat in that same, same thing with, with porn, like masturbation is not sex. It's not even remotely close. But the outlet is used by men today as a substitute for it. I agree. I think just based on what you said about combat, that, that, that is a very interesting point in that. I believe that, you know, you have people who think to themselves, you know, when I get into a boxing ring or I get into a cage, I'm good. When as soon as somebody hits me, I'm going to get angry and I'm going to 
but when it comes to it, if you get angry and you start swinging for the fences, you'll quickly find out, right, that a few one two down the pipe, you'll be on the floor very quickly. Yeah, I think you want to get your opponent angry because he'll make mistakes, and that's when you have an opening. And I mean, that's what I learned in my first fight, anyway. So to, okay, let's 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 go. Let's talk about your fight, Rich. Tell tell us the gory details and what happened in the fight. Tell, tell us, break it down for us. What happened? How did you do? <laughs> I mean, I I mean, I wish I could tell you a great story, but um, it, it was it was three two minute rounds. Um, it was very difficult finding an opponent because I'd been training for three or four years, and I was telling my coach, I said to Michael, you know, let's let's test this. Like, what's the point in training if we're not testing it? in some form of combat with a bell and corners and all that sort of stuff he said okay fine i said i want you to find somebody that's about my skill level and same age couldn't find anybody because apparently guys my age aren't stupid enough to box still so they so they <laughs> they either don't get start started at that point but um he found me somebody um who who happened to have one fight experience but he was also 20 years younger than me maybe 35 pounds heavier than me and about two inches taller than me so he wasn't ideal but i approached it from the perspective of i've changed you know i've been training for three to four years this guy hasn't he's only had one fight i've i've seen his fight he's a big boy he takes a lot of punishment but i deserve the win i went into the scenario with the mindset i deserve the win actually my trainer gave me this book uh you know to read before the that's custom my favorite, model my favorite trainer, Custe Amato. And, um, you know, one of the things that I took away from that, you know, was the fear component because you are scared. I mean, you know, you're putting your jaw on the line. I'm not a young man. When I get hurt, you know, things don't repair themselves very quickly. I feel it for a while. So there was some fear that was involved. So dealing with that was important. Dealing with the, I don't want to say entitlement, but dealing with the fact that you've put in the work and the time and, should walk away with the win was important to me. I brought a few people in that were important to me because I didn't want to let them down. So I kind of put myself in a position where I had to win. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a knockout win, but it was yeah. by a slight margin. And I and I threw a couple of really good hooks at this guy, man. I, I got him pissed off with a few jabs and he yeah. came at me and he lowered his hands and I got a few real good hooks in him. The, the, the third one, the last one, knocked his headgear almost sideways. He had to go back to his corner to put it back on straight. But it was a good feeling. It, it was a really, really good feeling, and it felt natural. It felt right. Well done, Rich. You represented for the team then, yeah? I gave it the old college try, man. <laughs> well done, well done. Okay, Rich, let's let's move on from physical combat. Let's talk about... Um, let's talk about... Let's, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Yeah. What is the goal of a man's life in, in your eyes? What should the goal be? Well... I think every man's going to have different goals. You know, if you ask 20 different people, you're going to get 20 different answers. But I think ultimately men inherently want to be recognized and they want access to beautiful women. Um, whether that's one woman forever or women simultaneously or one after the other, you know, you can decide what that looks like. But I think men want to find success and they want to find success in life to be recognized and they want success with women how they how they define that for a guy like uh ben shapiro that might just be marrying his you know his first or second or whatever she happened to be forming a, a media empire around it being a very smart talker um you know you ask another guy like donald trump you'll get a different answer if i asked you i'm sure i would get a different answer but i think success and being recognized is absolutely positively infused in that and that's why I, I tell guys very very clearly chase excellence man like that should be your number one thing define what excellence looks like for you and then commit to it okay i'm gonna read a tweet out to you by i'm sure you've seen this right by rollo tomasi a mm -hmm. rational male the quickest path to becoming a high value man number <laughs> one do not get married avoid family creation vasectomy in your 20s lift consistently Eliminate all sedations, learn game and networking, play to your strengths, build wealth, resist easing up on your focus. And you want my feedback on that. So I would love your feedback on that. It's, Richard. it's, it's clearly in my opinion, written to, um, infuriate and to ignite people that are on Twitter. And it worked quite clearly because everybody talked about it. I actually did a podcast about it the other night, touching on it. I know Rolo well, he wrote the intro to my book. 
Um, the whole part about the vasectomy, like it's it's basically to retard proof the uh, path to excellence because guys today, they they want to tell me what to do. They want a prescription. They want to give me A, B, C, D so I can get, you know, to Z. So the the list there isn't one that I would prescribe. I think getting getting a vasectomy is pretty dumb. Uh, uh, you, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, especially in your 20s. And if one of the main reasons why you're on the earth is to scatter seed, I mean, there's different ways to prevent birth aside from getting a vasectomy. But some guys are just stupid. You know, they'll just believe a woman when she says, oh, you can go into me. I'm not going to get pregnant. I have an IUD or, you know, whatever story that happens to be or I'm infertile, you know, whatever that is. So I think it's just to, you know, like essentially it idiot proof the list for people and of course to get views and to get a lot of people you know discussing that uh again you know that is that is a list or maybe some some might interpret as a prescription to becoming a high value man that's not what i would talk about though okay cool okay so let's go a little bit more onto the uh, side of women now um rich you talk about having an abundant mindset okay and could you firstly dive into a bit about what you mean by having an abundance mindset and also the dangers of, uh, of, of having the opposite of that? Yeah, I think a lot of guys today have a scarcity mindset. So when it comes to the notion of something like entrepreneurship, I think it's very sexy today. I think it has been for a while, you know, for being honest, for decades at least. I mean, I was very interested even in the 90s in it. Um, but I think a lot of guys are convinced or they have convinced themselves, whether it's through nurture or nature, that there's just not enough money out there, uh, that anybody that's acquired money is possibly and usually evil, and they're using it for nefarious purposes, that there's not enough, uh, like, oh, we all can't be entrepreneurs because then who would run, you know, who would work in the businesses, you know, for example. Um, there's a lot of ego investments that people make into uh, beliefs that they adopt and subscribe to that do not serve them. And it's why they get terrible results out of life. You can take a look at anybody's results and know and understand completely what their belief system looks like. It's, it, it's, it's a three-step sequence. It's beliefs, choices, results. Your beliefs daily will govern the choices that you make. Your choices will then govern the results that you get. It's a pretty clear and straightforward path. It's it's a it's a very powerful concept once you understand it. What about when it comes to women? When it comes to women in what regard? Okay, let's say for example, right, you have an individual and that person is with a woman and he is scared of leaving her because mm -hmm. he feels that he's not going to be able to go out there and be able to get another woman. Okay. And as soon as you develop that mindset, you're already setting yourself up for failure because yeah. you're restricted, right? Yeah. Yeah. They think that they've that they've done the best that they can. And nothing better can potentially exist. Um, that's incredibly arrogant in my eyes. There's there's eight billion people on the planet. Half of them are, are women. So there's roughly you know four billion women out there that you have that you could potentially have an opportunity with that could be a much better fit. Um, a lot of guys they develop an unhealthy attachment to a woman. It's I mean it's a concept that's known as one itis, and a lot of guys get it. You, you know they get laser focused on that one girl. And it could be because they don't have the option to get other girls. It could be because religion or culture, you know, convinced them of that, that, you know, she's the one. There's this notion of the soulmate myth that many men believe in. I think it's something that's been sold to us through Hollywood and media and Disney and stuff like that. All the films growing up were always like the prince and the princess and happily ever after. And, you know, there's an adversary out there that they have to deal with the whole, you know, Joseph Campbell hero's journey, you know, that story arc. So, it really just boils down to ego investments. It's it's stories. You know, people tell themselves stories all the time. Oh, I can't get girls because I'm not tall enough. I can't get girls because the color of my skin is wrong. I can't get girls because I don't have hair. I can't, you know, fill in the blank with whatever it happens to be. Um, if you believe it, then you're right. You know, it, it's it's whatever you believe that is correct. You know, whether you're whether you believe in the wolf of darkness or the wolf of light, the one that you feed is the one that 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 wins. I heard a story which I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about, Rich. Right? Is that there was um this was there was a person he was a, an ex army veteran. Um, he he I think he had he had to he had to exit the army early. I can't remember what the reason was, but anyway, he would often he was a, he was a shorter guy and. Um, he would go into bars and often get into fights with people and he'd pick fights with people just to prove himself. And mm -hmm. essentially what happened was in the end, he picked a fight with the wrong guy, got hit with the right hand, 
dropped, head hit the head hit the floor, and he's dead. Mm. And that just goes to show you them limiting self beliefs. It actually in that situation it cost him his life. That's mm. how serious it can get. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously that's an extreme story. But it's just the point I'm making is if you, when you prescribe to limiting self beliefs and don't believe that you are the man that you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it, you're going to hinder yourself in life, right? Absolutely. You know, these limitations that you set on yourself are gates and barriers that you see are real. There's a, um, there's a story that this guy told me once he was, uh, you know, he was working in Africa for decades. And, you know, he was telling us that they would sometimes have baby elephants, um, you know, whether they were orphaned or whatever happened, but they would have to raise them. And they would often just chain them with like a light dog chain when they were babies, you know, to keep them from, you know, maneuvering around and going off and causing havoc. And they would just stay, stay put, but they could also use that exact same light dog chain, a very small one where they were full grown adults because they believed that that same chain would prevent them from leaving. All they would have to do is just move their leg a little bit and the thing would completely shatter into a million pieces because at a, a full grown adult size, they've got that level of strength. So it's that, so it's that limiting belief. It's that barrier. It's that fence that you put around yourself. That is the reality that you live by. It's, it's, it's not what's out there. What, what happens to be real. It's the one that you set for yourself. That is real. It's very interesting. Rich, you know, I, fo I followed some of your work. I've listened to you for a while. And something that's been made abundantly clear to me, you tell me I'm wrong here, is that you are quite interested in the psychology of the mind. And you do look into historical facts and science quite a bit and the biology and the and, and human history. Am I correct? Yeah, I, I find it interesting because I mean, like theory is one thing. And then you've got studies and, and data and results and historical events that, that that start to pile up where you can start to draw reasonably safe and strong conclusions where you can then make an overt statement that you feel comfortable with. I don't say anything that I don't truly subscribe in or believe and haven't checked in with either, right? So when I state something as uncomfortable as some people might find it, that's fine. Maybe the discomfort that you're feeling is something that you need to look at. That's not my problem. Don't make your problems my problems, but that's how I view the world, right? Like that's how I see these realities when I come across them. True. I, I, I agree with you. And um, I think just following your work, I've learned a lot personally. But um, OK, so one thing I want to uh, I want to talk about here and just like you to comment on the back of it, if you could, Rich, as well. We were talking about this abundance mindset and having when you when you're thinking about, um, you know, your partner or the woman that you're with when you develop this so-called, you know, one-itis of you, as you put it, mm -hmm. what used to what you can start to do is you can develop one-itis for the wrong woman. And you can get yourself, and I find a lot of men do this, right, is you make the mistake where you get with a woman and when you're with that woman, she doesn't treat you right or, you know, whether that's to your face or behind your back or whatever it may be, she's not right for you. And then because you've got this one-nitis and this fear that if I leave this person, I'm not going to be able to find anybody else who matches up and that's what our human brain does right it de we develop these fear mechanisms mm -hmm. and it's them fear mechanisms that stop us from exiting outside of the and it's the same thing that applies when somebody's working in a job they may be fearful to leave that job and you get absolutely encapsulated by this one relationship and you get stuck in it and you keep dragging it dragging it dragging it up until a point where you physically can't be in, in it anymore because something really bad happens and you call it the train the train wreck, right? You call it rich. Yeah, it's a train wreck for a lot of guys. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want you to comment a little bit about that, and and you know, obviously, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of men who have been in these sort of, sort of train wrecks and stuck in them wrong, wrong relationships for too long. Yeah, it's amazing what men will put up with, isn't it? Um, so, they will look past a lot of different things. Um, in my book, I've got uh, 20 red flags in the Unplugged Alpha. And one of the reasons why I put that in the book is to help men identify common traits of problematic women. Um, these are things that, that, that started to pop up over and over again because guys were looking for prescriptions on, well, is this a good woman or is this a bad woman? Is this a red flag sort of thing? And I started to compile this list of what I started to call red flags. You'll notice now today, red flags is a very popular catch term out there because a lot of people have now adopted these flags that I've talking about, talked about. And in fact, a lot of them make content on the exact same red flags that are in my book. Um, there are things like daddy issues, dealing with women that have feminist ideologies, women that are always unhappy and unlucky. 
a woman that may compete with you in that relationship. She keeps men around from her past. Uh, she might be bad with money. She could be violent. I mean, I could go right down the list. You guys can get all that from the book in detail. But uh, it, if you pay attention to these things when you're dating, right? You know, if you're dating women and you're not in the committed phase, she hasn't said to you, where do we stand? I dig your vibe. I, I want to claim you sort of thing. Um, and, and you're very casual about it. Then once you identify what red flags are and you see them in women, you'll never get yourself to the point where you've actually exposed yourself to danger or risk or even put your wealth on the line. Or if you have children with her, then have to deal with custody issues later on down the road, because simply paying attention to red flags solves most of those problems for the vast majority of men. Some people get upset about that and they say it's not as binary or it's just not as black and white as that. And I would argue it pretty much is. You know, the ones that are saying that it's that it's not that simple usually have the red flags that I'm talking about, or at least a few of them anyway. I think it's extremely difficult. I think, um, you know, finding a, a woman who 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 has the green flags, has a minimal amount of red flags, is extremely difficult in today's day and age. Would you agree? I'd agree because, you know, women are overly entitled today. Uh, they have a enhanced sense of self-worth because before social media, um, women would get validation from men that they were exposed to face-to-face -face, uh, in the schoolyard and maybe the workplace if they were entering the workplace through family events, through churches, you know, social circles, stuff like that. Men would validate them by expressing interest in them, asking them out, wanting to take them on dates, telling them that they love them, things like that. Today, all a woman needs, even an average woman, even a four or five out of 10 can have a uh, social media following on Instagram, use the right filters, the right angles to take their photographs, the right clothing, and they'll get a flurry of likes and DMs and comments from men telling them that they praise them for their beauty and they would swoop in and save them, you know. All of these narratives, it's its its very, very common today. So you have, that's why you see these girls today on these podcasts. You know, there's a podcast format that's become quite popular where they essentially get these girls from large urban cities and they sit them down around a table. There's a few drinks that are passed around to sort of loosen the barriers. And they start having conversations about what are you looking for in a man? What's a high value man? You know, what about feminism? And you notice a common trend, you know, they're essentially using these women to make an example out of them, uh, to basically show guys, see, this is what women are made of today. But at the same time, you also see the level of, uh, like, like the overestimation that they have in their worth. Like a woman will say, well, I've slept with, you know, 50 guys, but I still believe that I am wife material and that a man should look past my past and the choices that I've made in the past and the 50 men that I've laid with and commit to me, put babies in, in me, provide a house for me, all of that sort of stuff. So we live in strange times. You know, we certainly don't live in our grandparents' times. It's been said that my granddad, for example, it was it was simple for him to find a woman that's two or three times as good as a woman today for half the work. You know, Rich, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit there because I disagree with you a bit. I think that, you know, I used to think that you know, times and obviously, right, times have gotten a lot worse and things have gotten a bit more crazier now. But mm -hmm. I believe that our our thinking of, you know, in, in my granddad's day that it was like this and women were like that. I don't actually believe that's the case. I think that if you went back to them times, you'd, you know, maybe it'd be a bit more subtle. Maybe it would be, you know, across across the street. They'd be just looking and giving a little wave maybe. Mm -hmm. And then it develops in secret. But I, I believe that. And, and, and as I got older and I started speaking to Actually, I should speak to my father about this, about my granddad and some of the issues that he faced. And some of them stories that I heard were were unbelievable. I couldn't believe that my granddad actually faced some of these same issues that we're facing in the year 2023. It's insane. Well, women were still hypergamous back then. There's no doubt about that. They would always want the best that they can get. But the difference today is women have been sold this... Uh, you know, this book of lies, toxic feminism is what I would call it. You know, they're drunk on this cool that if a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle and, uh, you know, men are incompetent. Men have been have been portrayed throughout media, culture, advertising, Hollywood for decades now of being bumbling fools. You turn on any television show or, or sitcom, even from the 80s or 90s, the men were always portrayed as morons and the women were portrayed as heroes. That is a 
stark difference from the Leave It to Beaver days, for example, which were the television shows that um, my parents and grandparents, you know, sort of grew up on even, even prior to that. So, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that women are women and men are men. But at the end of the day, women today are very, very different from the types of women that our parents dated. Uh, they, they have lower notch counts back then than what they do today. It's, it's pretty common today, especially when women sort of lean into the toxic feminism narrative and you can be as promiscuous as men can without consequence sort of thing. and slut shaming sort of, it still kind of exists, but it's not like it was back in the day sort of thing. Women are very different today. Um, I'm not taking away the fact that challenges exist in our parents and grandparents age. The fact of the matter is that the challenges today are very different. And I think they're harder for men today. It's, it's, it's a lot more difficult for men today to pair bond monogamously to one chick over a long period of time because women today are not wired that way anymore like they were decades ago. Okay, so Rich, tell me this, right? So let's say you've got a woman who's who's had a high notch count and she's she's been with multiple men and she decides she wants to change and uh, settle down and she she doesn't want to live that life anymore. What does she, what does she do? You can't you can't take away the fact that that exists from her past. A smart woman would hide that from her past. She's not going to overtly, you know, walk around with a T-shirt that says, "Hey guys, I've slept with fifty men and here's all their names," sort of thing. Um, that that would be an incredibly stupid choice for a woman to make to broadcast that information. Unfortunately, though, women do that kind of by osmosis by their digital footprint. Um, I've talked about this in some videos before, but there's this trend now on social media. I mean, you'll see it on TikTok. There's a video that I've done on my YouTube channel the last couple of months where this mid 30 year old woman, I think she was in Tulum at the time and she's breaking down her date with a guy and why she's no longer seeing him. Basically she's saying, you know, I spent, you know, four or five dates with him. Uh, we slept together and then he kind of ghosted me and went away and I don't know why and men are children, but I'll find my true love sort of thing. So the point here is that women do leave a digital footprint. Um, it would be, or it should be encouraged that fathers and mothers have the conversation with their daughters. That is, your value is based on your beauty and your purity. It always has been. It's been that way throughout history. You can drink as much Kool-Aid on the toxic feminism lie as you want. It's simply not true. A high value, virtuous, successful man that knows what his worth is will every single day of the week choose a pure clean woman over a woman that's been with a whole bunch of guys and party through her 20s saying that i've gotten right with god and that i want you to look past me past my past is what beta males fall for that's what the plugged in guys fall for now what's the dangers of that well setting aside the fact that there's a higher probability that she'll be a single mom there's a higher probability that she's had abortions there's a higher probability that she's got mental disorders these are all facts they've been proven in studies um it, once you set that aside one of the biggest problems for guys is when they get involved into a marriage with a woman that's been with a lot of guys the probabilities of her forming a healthy pair bond to him throughout the marriage and staying married to him happily is dramatically lower um there's lots of data uh, published on this. I think the Teachman study would be the main one. You guys can look that up. But essentially, um, a virgin is a far better choice than a woman that slept with eleven guys. Okay, so so Rich, I was I was thinking about which way I take this conversation. It was two questions I was going to ask you, but just based on what you said, I'm going to ask you my next question, which I've got here. Right now, I'm a Muslim. Okay. And um, there is a, uh, a philosopher who was uh, quite prominent in the 11th and 12th century. His name was Al-Ghazali. He was one of the early contributors to when Islam was in its golden age. And um, he, in his book, he states, there are eight qualities which render a conjural life happy and which must be sought in the woman in order to assure the perpetuity of the marriage. Mm. Piety, good character, beauty, a small dowry, ability to bear children, virginity, good lineage, and she should not be a close relative. That makes sense. It's a, that's a very reasonable list. It's interesting because now, okay, so let me, let me ask you the second question, right, on, just on the back of that, right? 
if this is what is prescribed to be a high value woman, which is going to obviously, you know, the whole idea of this is that, you know, if you are marry a woman with these sorts of intangibles, mm -hmm. then you're going to have more chance of success of a successful marriage. And then the children that you bear and the family that you raise, you know, is going to be a success. But what about men? Right. Why do these same elements not you know why are they not prescribed to men they, ne they haven't been in history that's just mm -hmm. a fact right they haven't been prescribed in any mm -hmm. culture to men but why is that the case well men and women are different aren't they and i think that's one of the areas that culture and society gets wrong terribly today is that they is they is they try to blur the lines as much as possible they say men and women are equal men and women are exactly the same whatever a man can do a woman can do and for some areas of life that's true uh, a man can drive a car from point A to point B, and so can a woman. The man will probably park the car better at point B than the woman will, and that's just that's just a reality of life. You know, there's certain things that men and women are better at. Women are better at empathy. Women are far better at love and sympathy for you know things. They're more agreeable than men are. You know, men are stronger. You know, we've got uh, a third or maybe fifty percent more upper body strength than women do. Uh, so we have strengths and weaknesses and i don't know why society and culture keeps trying to perpetrate this lie that we're exactly the same when we're not and one of the things that differs from men is uh they can get away with sleeping with multiple women and still fall in love with a woman commit to her for life and raise a happy healthy family just fine but the same is not true for women promiscuity and sexual partners play a completely different role in a woman's life than a man does. And in fact, I mean, if you were to tell a woman, well, he slept with 20 guys, she'll pro she, she probably won't care. In fact, it's desirable when you survey a, a lot of women that they want a guy with some experience because there's some social proof there. there there's some pre-selection that 20 other women wanted to be with him. It's one of the reasons why you know, there's this funny joke out there that like that um, a woman today would rather date or sleep with a married man than be with a loser that lives in his mom's basement because the married guy has pre-selection, right? Another woman has chosen him. He has resources that he can distribute and share, which is why, you know, you get these phenomenons that actually happen. It's interesting, though, isn't it? It's a good question. I think I'll tell you my take on this, honestly speaking, right? I'll give you my opinion on this. I think that... You know, when you have a, a relationship, you have one relationship, a second and a third and a fourth, right? As soon as you get to that fourth, fifth, and you start and you start building on it, whether it's a woman or a man, my opinion is, right, you carry baggage from one to the other. You do. Okay? And what happens is you may be involved in a relationship, whether it's male or female, where you have trauma in that relationship. And that mm. trauma can carry over to the later part of your life. And then by the time you get with somebody, whether you are male or female, if you've had a high, and I don't think it's so much solely about the notch count, I think it's about the mental implication as well mm. that you have. So if you've had, you know, if you have a person who's had 10 relationships, 15 relationships, long-term ones with damage in, you know, in their relationships, and that person is in their thirties or forties, a woman or a male, mm -hmm. I think you're going to, you know, the, the person who gets with that individual is going to have to deal with a lot of problems and trauma. Yeah. I think you're right about the baggage part and that and that definitely applies to women i've noticed women that have been with a lot of guys have a lot more baggage there's more of he hurt me he cheated on me he did whatever to me and they never really seem to like suss through that they never seem to work that out i think men do carry baggage too um you know we all have been betrayed in our past you know women have done things that uh have surprises have shocked us it's one of the things that sends men down the rabbit hole of the red pill and you know, like the concepts that I talk about in my book and a lot of my videos is they find it because they've been betrayed, because they believed in something that wasn't a reality, that they're then shown a truth or a reality that's very uncomfortable, it's difficult, even painful for a lot of men. And they have to confront it. Um, men need to confront these realities. So I think guys that have that have done the work and they've confronted it, they come out better for it. But yeah, you're right. Men and women do carry baggage. It's just I see men dealing with the baggage better than women. Women seem to just carry it around and it never really seems to go away for them. Interesting, because this is this is what I this is where I kind of stand with this is that I think that so a lot of the issues that you talk about when when selecting um, a good woman, I believe that a lot of 
them qualities, but then you have additional qualities also apply to men. But the difference is, is that when a woman selects a man, she needs that man to be a high value man in terms of his career as well. And I don't think that applies necessarily this in the opposite direction. But yeah. there are definitely crossovers between the two. Yeah, because I mean, the biggest difference is that men are viewed as success objects by women. So their notch count doesn't really matter. As long as they're successful, they're competent, they can make it rain. They're, they're strong, they're virtuous, you know, they can look up to the guy. That's, that's what's most important to, to, to women. Whereas for men, women, women are, are beauty objects. So a lot of what women do today to try to make themselves more attractive to men, like you'll see them online and they'll brag about their degrees and how smart they are and they have their own house and they have their own car. Well, what they're defining is what, me, is what makes men attractive. And they think that if they behave and they act like men, that they will be more attractive to men. But there's no man ever throughout history that's ever looked at a woman's degree on a wall, framed in mahogany with little letters after a name that said, oh yeah, look at the degree on her, that's hot. They're looking at her walking away in her nice yoga pants. That's just <laughs> that's just the reality. <laughs> that's just the reality. I could sit here and uh, say whatever I want, but that is that that is that is the it's reality, facts. Right? It's truth, man. Yeah, it's facts. It's facts. <laughs> okay. Um. But but Rich. Okay. On the other side, right? You know, you obviously, right? You you have women, right, who want to pursue goals. Now, obviously, we've been a traditionally a boxing platform, right? And you've seen this rise in women's boxing, and you have people like women mm -hmm. like Katie Taylor doing very well. Um, and you've had other female fighters as well, but women's boxing is increasing, okay? And it's not just boxing, it can be any career. Do you not believe that women should have the right to be able to pursue whatever career path that they want to do? Look, I think women can, I think anybody should be able to do whatever they want. I'm a libertarian, just, you know, stay out of my life, stay out of my pockets. I don't want the government involved in anything. So that's just me. But is that what is aligned with their biological imperative? Because for women, they start having this desire, this want, this need in their mid to late 20s to have children. Not all women, but the vast majority of women start hearing the biological clock ticking. And that's when they start taking dating and men a little more seriously. And they have to sort of get themselves what right and squared away and find a guy so they can go and do that. Now, you can climb the corporate ladder. You can get into combat sports and fight other women. That doesn't matter to me. But the reality is if you're going to commit to why you're on this earth and what your biological imperative continues to tell you, which is to breed and to have children, then beating up other women is not really aligned with that. I don't find it interesting. I don't find watching anybody chase excellence, you know, to be honest with you, interesting. Um, there, there's elements of it that I might, you know, pay attention to. But one of the things that I may comment on that some people tend to disagree with and many tend to agree is, I don't watch professional sports. It doesn't make sense to me to watch other men on a soccer pitch or anywhere else chasing excellence and I'm and I'm cheering for them. The funny thing that I find interesting is when men and their girlfriend are watching, let's say like a football match and his girlfriend has the name of another man on her back. Or another heavyweight champion. Or another heavyweight champion. It doesn't it doesn't matter what it, whatever it happens to be, but yeah. you know, like I said, if you want to get into sports and get your face smashed in and, you know, compete like men, like this is, this is one of the things that did not exist a hundred years ago. Like women only got involved in the Olympics. I think it was 1910 or 1911 or something like that in the early 1900s. Prior to that, it was just men competing. Now I get why some women play sports. I like, I get why men watch women's tennis. Women's tennis is interesting because there's a lot of, you know, gal parts and skirts and short tops and stuff like that moving around. I don't get why anybody would watch women beat the crap out of each other. That's not interesting to me. It, it's not attractive and I don't find it uh, remotely um, like in the, in the hierarchy of, of combat that I can give my attention to, I'd rather watch two of the strongest men fight than watch two of the strongest women fight. It just doesn't interest me. It's not, it's not competition in my eyes anyway. No, I think and, and to be to be to, to stick to the statistics and obviously you're a scientific person and you stick to the facts, right? The facts are that male sports are obviously more watched. When you compare boxing, male boxing. Yeah, they get paid more boxing. too, don't they? Because there's more viewership. Yeah, and and I think that this argument of women should be paid. I I, I don't. No, think that's it's silly. Should, no, because you, you should you be get paid, paid based on the eyeballs that you draw, right? Like, should I be paid as much as Mr. Beast for uploading a YouTube video? I don't generate the millions or tens of millions of views that he generates 
because I'm just uploading the same platform. That's the same argument, you know, saying that a woman should be paid the exact same amount that a man should, you know, for entering the boxing ring. No, you should be paid for the amount of eyes that you generate on that sport. Right. All right. Okay, Rich. I've got another um let's let's go on to a slightly different topic before we, sure. before we close off, right? In your book you talked about young men driving a motorcycle like in your life you should get a motorbike. Mm -hmm. And you said that it's the equivalent of of riding a horse in the and riding a stallion in the old days. Would I think you so. elaborate and comment on that? Riding a motorcycle is it's a rite of passage. You know, it's one of the things that 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 men can do which um allows them to be men not a lot of women ride motorcycles you'll get some women that do but it but is predominantly a male pastime whether it's sport bikes whether it's harleys whether it's uh, off-road enduro type type of motorcycles it requires dexterity it requires balance it, it, like riding a, a a motorcycle is not as easy as driving a car uh, there's a manual shift mechanism for the vast majority of bikes even still today uh, if, if you have an accident, the toll that you pay is much higher than being in a safety cage, like, you know, like a car. Um, I think it's something that men should consider for a vast, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, one, the, the speed is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's cheap speed. Um, you can buy a, a, a $10,000, 600 CC super bike, and it'll be just about as fast as most $300,000 supercars today. You know, once you roll on the gas. Um, they get better gas mileage. They break as well. The only thing that they don't do quite as well is they don't corner as well because the contact patches are a little bit smaller, but it's, but it's great for dating. I mean, if you're a single guy, there's nothing that I found that, that got women as interested in you as offering, you know, to put a helmet on them and put them on the back of your bike on the first date. She's required to put her entire life and trust in you on the back seat of a motorcycle. And she has to be intimate with you because she has to wrap her arms around you and hold on to you nice and tightly. So I think it's a great way for guys to get started in the world, especially in their 20s. Be careful. Keep your head on a swivel. Uh, but it's certainly viewed, in my opinion, as a rite of passage. Sounds exhilarating. I think I need to go try it. Um, I'm not, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't ridden a motorcycle in this country. In other countries I have, but not in here, yeah. not in this country. But yeah, it sounds extremely exhilarating. And I think that was one of the elements in your book, which I found very unique and something that I've never heard before. So yeah. I just wanted you to comment and uh, elaborate on that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, get a motorcycle, get into combat sports, fight, uh, make sure that you're laying the groundwork for your life, chase excellence, not women, um, and take care of yourself, man. You know, like self-care is incredibly important. You, you only get as, as far as we know, we only get one go at this. Okay. And once it's over, maybe there's a bonus round for us. Maybe there isn't, but the one that we have right now, I would, I would take the, I would take life seriously. I don't think enough guys take life seriously enough and they just kind of float through it. They're rudderless through it. They don't make clear, concise choices that are for their own betterment. So that would be my closing advice. Rich, just before I let you go, okay, I want you to, particularly for the younger viewers, right, who are about to make some major mistakes in their life, right? I want you to please, you've obviously dealt with several individuals who have come after you know i've come from a train wreck and mm. i've heard some of your stories which are just completely crazy and insane could you tell us one of the most craziest stories that you've heard that someone's come to you and explained you know i've gone through this trauma i was with a woman and this happened do you think you could you could tell us one on the top of your head well i mean if i tell you the worst one um it's probably the guy i believe i had him on a podcast once on my channel i you know the title of the podcast escapes me but the short version of it was he was going through divorce and she essentially tried to uh, poison him. She tried to kill him. Um, and she went to some great lengths to end his life, cover up what she did to end his life, lie in court. Um, it was it was about four or five years of hell. Um, there's some people out there that have said, you haven't experienced trauma and pain until you've been in a boxing match and punched hard. Um, I can tell you from a guy that's been through divorce, which wasn't as bad for me, obviously nobody tried to kill me. Uh, but there are a lot of men out there that have been through a lot of difficulties with extremely difficult, in some cases, crazy women that look absolutely normal when you meet them. Again, that's why I tell guys vet for the 20 red flags. That's why I put that as a chapter in my book. It's a free chapter, by the way, you can go just, just 
go to my Twitter and you can download it by opting into my email list. Um, but it's, it's really, really important not to put yourself in a compromising situation like that because things can get very bad. Some men have lost their life. You know, one of the um, difficulties uh, and tough conversations that aren't had that that often is that men going through a divorce have a much, much, much higher suicide rate than women do. I think it's 10 times, if not more higher today. Uh, but it is absurd. And it's because it's usually men that suffer because family law is written to protect and serve women. And unfortunately, women tend to find ways to manipulate these laws to their benefit. So it can be difficult to, you know, for men. So that's the short version of the story. Yeah, I think I actually heard the statistic, and obviously it varies depending on where you are on the planet, which country, but I believe it was about 800%, so about eight times higher for men than it is women, yeah. um, which is which speaks volumes to, you know, mental health issues and, you know, what people are going through with, with women and, you know, having a train wreck in their life. So I think for young people, it's really important that you, you, you vet check the woman that you're getting with and uh, you chase excellence in your life, not women. And... Just be careful, but don't live, you know, I, I think it's important that you also don't live a life which is too much, you know, on the sort of statistic side and some things you need to kind of let develop, but just use your common sense, right? And and navigate your way through life in what's natural and just do the best that you can with the cards that you're given and work hard. And I think that's the bottom line, right, Rich? Yeah, I just want to be clear. Not all women are bad. Like, like one of the things people like to take out of context is, oh, you know, Rich, Rich is always complaining about women or Rich says that all women are, no. I have a girlfriend. I've been with her for years. She's great. But there's certain boundaries that you want to set around your life and structure in your life so that you don't complicate it unnecessarily. Uh, I'm at a stage in my life where I don't have an interest in having any more kids and marriage doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So why would I ever get married again? As much as she may want to, and she may one day come to me and say, Rich, if we don't get married, then I'm going to leave you and find somebody else. I have to be in a position where it's like, fine. Okay. It's been good. Enjoy yourself. And let it go. The unplugged alpha, Richard Cooper himself. <laughs> right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, Rich, um, your book, The Unplugged Alpha, it's available on Amazon. Where can people buy your book? Uh, if you just go to the website, actually, just you know, below over here at richcooper.ca, it's got links to everything, my YouTube, my book, everything's all there. Lovely. Rich, I hope to talk to you again soon. Um, we'll, we'll arrange something, right? We'll put something together. Um, Sam, it's been yeah. a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Rich. Appreciate your time. Thanks.